great pleasure to introduce our unifying speaker this morning, Professor Michael Ernst, who honestly doesn't need a lot of introduction because his work is so well known that it speaks for itself. Mike is the author of DICON, a system for dynamically generating, dynamically inferring program environments. He introduced pluggable type checkers to Java, a system that now runs daily in production in Google. He is also behind Radoop, a, a feedback-driven test generation system that helped to discover bugs in systems such as Sun, uh, Sun SDK, and a lot of other influential fundamental work that advance the theory and the practice of programming languages, software engineering, security, formal methods, and other fields. Um, yeah, Mike is a professor at the University of Washington in beautiful Seattle. He is an SEM fellow. He is a recipient of upcoming XC17 Most Influential Paper Award. He is an author of many, I stopped counting, more than 10 papers that received Best Paper Awards in conferences such as ICSI, FSE, ISTA, ECOOP, and others. And not less important, he is a wonderful human being, great researcher, who is always interested in other people's work and is fun to talk to. So I think we are very fortunate to have Mike here today. And I will give the stage to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Julia, for the very generous introduction. Um, it is a privilege to be here talking to you, able to share a, a research vision. Uh, and it's also a privilege to work with a great many very talented colleagues. So I've listed a few of them on, the, on this first slide. So I want to start out by asking you a question. Um, how many of you have used software? How many of you have written software? What software? Different people have very different answers to this question. So oftentimes when I'm asked this by a relative over a holiday dinner, I'll tell them, well, it's a recipe. It's a, a list of instructions for performing some operation. And this is a really powerful view of software because uh, it essentially says this is an engineered artifact. Uh, we understand its semantics, and we can apply formal analysis to it. And I've performed a lot of formalizations just like this. I'm not going to be talking about those today. I want to think about other views of what software is. If you think about how do programmers spend their day, they don't spend all of their day just working on that one uh, engineered artifact. They deal with test cases and the version control history and issue tracker, documentation. And so when we think about helping programmers, when we think about program analysis, we should be thinking about analyzing all parts of the program not just one little part of the program that's particularly easy to analyze. Let me try to say the same thing in a slightly different way. If you think about uh, all the things that programmers do when they're programming, they think about uh, they have requirements, they have discussions. Uh, there's a lot of things, and there's also the program itself. That's one part of it. Um, and when we think about the program itself, there's the programming language. But there's also the structure of the program, there's documentation, there are other things as well. So if you're interested in, in just programming languages, you're interested in this very small slice of what programming is, and even a small slice of what programs are. But it's a really powerful view, because we can do those formalizations that I talked about before. What I want to do is think about zooming back out and looking at the big picture. How can we do uh, analysis of this entire artifact. It's not amenable to the same kinds of formal analysis. And so I think we should really think of this not as an engineered artifact that we can do mathematical proofs about, but as a natural artifact, the sort that, uh, that natural scientists will often examine. So that means we need to use a different set of techniques. Uh, here is a list of just a few that I've done. Machine learning over executions, uh, analysis of version control histories, predicting bugs, uh, determining whether upgrades are going to be safe, uh, prioritizing warnings, program repair. Let me give you an example of just one of these, uh, machine learning over executions. So to set the stage, specifications are really useful. We need them. And 
they're often not available, but tests are available, but we tend to ignore them. So there are a lot of papers that start out, given a program and its specification, blah, blah, blah. Here are some amazing things we can do. And that's good research. The problem is it's not applicable to... I'm, I'm, I've heard that there are some programs that don't have a full formal specification. And so that research isn't applicable to those programs. Now, people do write tests, but oftentimes when we're doing a formal analysis, we ignore those tests. The formal verification process is usually you write the program, then you run some tests, because you'd be crazy to. Testing doesn't give you any guarantee, but it's the best way to find errors quickly. And then you verify the program, but you ignore all those testing artifacts, all that effort that you put into there. Why do we do that? Programmers put a lot of effort into building those tests. There's a lot of really good semantic information in those tests. So why don't we translate those tests into specifications? Why don't we extract that semantic information and formalize it? One way to do that is by machine learning over executions. So there's a technique called dynamic discussion of likely invariants, or um, more commonly, specification mining. It uh, runs a program, observes the values that the program computes, and then generalizes over those values. It does machine learning over those values, to, and it outputs a set of properties, the sort of things you might see in an assert statement or a specification, like x is greater than the absolute value of y, or a, a relationship among variables, or that uh, the data structures in your program have certain shape, like parents and children have certain relationships. Now, because this is a machine learning technique, it's unsound and it's incomplete. But, like many good machine learning techniques, it's actually useful. And it's even useful for uh, for formalization. For instance, it can, uh, can direct a formal proof system. So we have, uh, we have this way of formalizing based on programming languages, and that showed you that you can actually turn tests into formal specifications too. You can think of them even for semantics-based problems. What do, now, this is kind of weird, because when I look at everything that's outside that little red box, it's all squishy. It's, uh, it, it's very difficult to think about how can we, uh, can we really think about that in terms of semantics. But what I want to do in this talk is to think about taking another one of those squishy artifacts and trying to extract semantic information from it. In particular, the natural language in a program, like English, the documentation, the output strings, the variable names, etc. So that's what I'm going uh, to try to convince you could be a good thing to do in the future. So in particular, I'm going to talk about four different problems. One problem is when the diagnostic messages that are output by your software are inadequate. Another problem is when uh, there's a bug, when there are incorrect operations. Another is when there are, you haven't written enough tests. And a final one is when there's just code that isn't implemented and you need that. So in each case, we're going to take some natural language that the programmer has written and, and try to use that. So there are four different sources of natural language. One is the error messages in the program. Another is the variable names. Another is code comments. And the final one is user questions. And I'm also using four different natural language processing techniques. Each one actually comes from a different decade of the natural language processing uh, literature. One is traditional document similarity, the sort of thing that Google search was built upon. Another is word semantics, like uh, uh, comparing words in a dictionary. Another is parsing, uh, you know, English language uh, or natural language parsing. And the final one is machine translation, a very recent technique. Another way to think about the things I'm presenting are that the first two are about analyzing existing code and uh, informing programmers of things that may be wrong with it. And the last two are about generating new code so that the programmer doesn't have to write that code. So let me start out with the first one, about inadequate diagnostic messages. So the scenario, the problem we're trying to solve is that after a user supplies a wrong configuration option, like minus minus port num equals 100.0, the software issues some really unhelpful error message, something like unexpected system failure or unable to establish connection. The latter is the actual uh, th these are both actual examples. The latter one corresponds to this particular wrong configuration option. So this is really hard for end users to diagnose. They don't have access to the source code. The only thing they have is this error message, and they need to diagnose. 
What we'd like to do is to detect these types of problems before we ship the code, before a user experiences this in the field. What we want to do is to inform the programmer this error message is not going to be helpful to people when they see it, and let the programmer fix the error message before shipping the code. So what's hard about proactively detecting these inadequate messages? First is, how do we determine the sorts of errors that, that users might make in the field? And the second is, uh, when we see the output that's produced, how do we know that output is, is not a useful output? So we built a tool called ConfDiag Detector, and it has a particular solution to each of these two problems. The solution to the first problem is configuration mutation, then running the system tests. So in particular, take a configuration, make some small change to it, and run the system tests. If the test system tests succeed, then maybe it was still a legal configuration. But if the system tests fail, then we know that was not a legal configuration. And furthermore, we know the exact uh, error message, and we know the exact root cause that caused that error message. OK, now that we have a root cause and an error message, how do we know if that error message leads a user to that root cause? So we're going to use natural language processing to check the semantic meaning of that error message. In particular, what I want to know is, uh, is the diagnostic message that the system produced, does it have the same natural language semantics as the section of the manual that discusses that particular configuration option? So essentially, we're going to compare these two things. And notice there's a, uh, an assumption I'm making here. I'm assuming you have a user manual or web pages or man pages or uh, you, know, you can scrape this off of Stack Overflow or something like that. If you don't have any of those, then you have bigger problems that I'm not going to be able to help you with here. So great, when is that message uh, adequate? Well, essentially, there are two ways to figure this out. One is, if it actually mentions the exact root cause mutated option name or the value, then people can figure it out. And other people in the past had already done this, and it, it works well. Like, the mutated option is percentage split, and the diagnostic message mentions that. People can figure that out. Our contribution is to think about the semantic meaning. So for instance, if the mutated option is fnum, and the diagnostic message is number of folds must be greater than one, then if we look at the user manual's documentation of minus minus fnum, if that was sets number of folds for crass validation, then we say a user would be able to take that message and find the relevant section in the manual. So, how, so this is essentially a question of document similarity. So how is document similarity done? The classical way that document similarity is done is via something called TF-IDF and cosine similarity. So uh, there are essentially two steps here. Machine learning is awesome, because machine learning can deal with any type of data whatsoever as long as it's a vector of reals. So whatever data you have, you have to turn it into a vector of reals. So the first job is convert every document into a, a vector of reals. And then the second job is just determine the similarity between those two vectors of reals via cosine, vector cosine similarity. And now, for every pair of documents, you know how similar those two documents are. So how are we going to do that first task, converting a document into a vector of reals? Well, we can, take, we can make the vector, its length is the length of your dictionary. And each value is the number of times the word appears. So for instance, on this slide, the word classical appears twice, the word document appears eight times, the word problem appears three times, the word values appears three times, and so forth. And this vector would be as long as uh, your entire dictionary, with many, many zeros. So the problem with this is that really frequent words like the and of and and swamp out everything else. So if you have a document that uses the and of and and, it's going to compare as very similar to other documents that have the and of and and. So the solution to this is don't use the values that I just showed you. Don't use term frequency. Use term frequency times inverse document frequency. Inverse document frequency essentially says if a word appears in every document, it's not important at all. If a word appears in just one or two documents, then for those documents, it's really relevant. 
So this is great, and this is the way that document similarity is done. The problem is, it doesn't work very well on very short documents because of all those zeros in the vector. Um, so we use a slightly different technique, uh, also from natural language processing community, uh, that works on shorter documents. So it essentially says two documents have similar semantic meaning if they have a lot of words with similar semantic meaning. So here's how it works. You take two, your two short documents, like the program goes wrong and the software fails. First, remove the stop words. Those are those noise words like the and of and and. Then, for every word in one of the documents, try to find a word in the other document with similar meaning, like program and software, or goes wrong and fails. And finally, you say that their two sentences are similar if you're able to make a lot of these matchings. So we implemented this and uh, tried it on uh, four open source projects. It reported 25 missing diagnostics and 18 inadequate diagnostics. Um, and then we had three programmers look at the output to say, uh, does, uh, does this message help me to find the, the real root cause? Our system had 0% false negative rate. A false negative would be if the tool says this message is adequate, and a programmer says, oh, that wouldn't have helped me actually find the problem. And the tool had a 2% false positive rate. A false positive is rate is when the tool says, oh, this message is not good enough. Programmer, you need to improve this message. But the programmer says, oh, I could have figured that out from that. And this, uh, this compares very favorably to the previous best results in the literature that had 16%. Uh, that, that had a uh, lower recall and had 16% false positive rate. So there has been a lot of other work in this area. Um, much of it is about diagnosing configuration errors uh, after they appear. So if something happens in the field, how can we understand what happened? Whereas ours is trying to be proactive, uh, help letting developers do it uh, during development. There are also a lot of general techniques for helping uh, improve software diagnosability, but they, typically, they tend to be very heavyweight. They require source code or the usage history or even operating system level support. So let me tell you about a second problem. And this is the problem of incorrupt operations. What if there's a bug in your program? So um, I, think I would love to be a billionaire like all the other e-commerce uh, giants. So I decided I would write my own little web store. And this is the code that I started out with. I'm pretty proud of it. I think I'm well on my way to riches. What do people think about this code? Oh, so someone says there's a type error. But I assure you there's no type error. And the reason is, it's all integers, and I ran it through the compiler. <laughs> but you're right. I mean, there is an error in the abstract types. So trying to add a price and a shipping distance. So the compiler was completely unhelpful here. It issued no warning because everything was integers. But you could figure out that this was wrong, which is great for you. Now, um, my general philosophy is, if you can figure it out, or I can figure it out, then surely a computer can figure it out. So let's, let's see how we, can make, figure, let's how we can get a computer to figure this same thing out. Here's a general idea. And the general idea is to do exactly what you and I just did. Um, we're going to look at the variables based on the words in the variable names and cluster them based on semantic similarity, natural language similarity. Then we're also going to look at the program text to see how variables are used. And that's going to tell us about abstract types. And if there are any differences in these clusters, then either you have a bug or you have a badly named variable. Let me give, uh, give you another, uh, another visualization of this. So here's a bunch of variables. Um, here's a bad interaction that we don't want to happen. And if we just look at the program types, they don't help us because that interaction is within uh, one of these clusters. But if I cluster it based on the meaning, based on my ability to read the English words in these variable names, then I get a different set of clusters. And now I see the interactions actually across clusters. And that's a problem. 
So here's another way of visualizing that. These are uh, lots of variables. And what we want to do is cluster based on the interactions, on the operations. Like if A and B are used together, if you say A plus B, or if you say C is less than D. Then we also want to cluster based on the language, based on the names and the variables. And now compare these clusters. Where's the problem here? These clusters are not the same. And there are quite a few places where they differ. But which one is the, but, but what, where is the problem? Yes, you're exactly right, the bottom one. This is where the problem is. It's perfectly fine to have uh, two different lists, one of which holds distances and another which holds prices. But it's not okay to have um, this interaction go across different uh, concepts in the program. So the actual algorithm is a little bit different than this. What it really does is it first does the clustering based on operations, then it does the clustering based on names, a subclustering within each cluster, not a global one. And then it looks for every name cluster, did it cluster into, sorry, for every operation cluster, did it cluster into name clusters really nicely? And if it did, that's suspicious. So how do we do these two, so now we need to do two different clusterings. How are we gonna do those clusterings? The clustering based on operations is a technique called abstract type inference. You can do it statically or dynamically. We did use it dynamically because it's more precise. So essentially what it does is it looks at the operations and if you have A plus B, then the programmer must have meant for A and B to be the same type. If you have C is less than D, the programmer must have meant for C and D to be the same type. So that's how this would separate out all of these uh, operate, all of the variables in this particular little routine. The clustering based on variable names is the novel part here. And the idea is we want to take two variable names and determine their similarity. So the first step is tokenize it. Turn that variable name into lots of English words. And that uses underscores and camel case and recognizes abbreviations and so forth. So uh, something like uh, in auth's key could turn into in authentication's key. Uh, it's a best effort approach. Then for every pair of uh, words, for, for every pair of words across the two variable names, compute their semantic similarity. We use an old technique, uh, which is WordNet. That's a uh, dictionary that essentially has linkages between definitions. The closer two things are, the more similar their meaning. You could also imagine using edit distance or a more modern technique like word embeddings. And then finally, we combine the word similarity into the variable name similarity. Essentially, for every word in one variable name, find the most similar one in the other variable name, and then average over those. So we ran this on some programs, including, including grep and the XM mail server. And the top-based uh, mismatch in grep indicated an undesired variable interaction. In particular, uh, this code loses the top three bytes of depth. It doesn't happen to be exploitable here because there's a guard in a far removed part of the program, but it's definitely a code smell. So there's been a lot of people who've observed that variable names actually matter a lot, um, that you shouldn't reuse them, that you should have naming conventions that convey information. Um, there are uh, languages like uh, F-sharp and Ada that have units of measure built right in. That would take care of some issues like this, but it's not nearly as general as what I'm talking about because uh, it only uh, handles some subset of types that have been determined by the designer ahead of time. And other people have tokenized variable names. It turns out our tokenization is a little bit better than theirs. Let me tell you about a third uh, problem and approach. And that's a problem of missing tests. So uh, as background, recall that a test consists of two parts. It consists of an input and an oracle. A lot of people, when they think of a test, they just think of the input. Uh, for a unit test, an input would be a sequence of method calls. For, uh, for a system test, it might just be an input file. And then an oracle is a Boolean condition that tells you, did your test succeed or not? Maybe it's the exact output file that should be produced. Maybe it's an assert statement. So 
two ways to generate to get tests are for programmers to write them or for the machines to generate them. When programmers write tests, they often use trivial oracles, like, did the software crash or not? That's helpful, but it's, it's not really getting at the semantics. Um, and programmers don't write enough tests. They don't like to do it. So automatic generation of tests is a really promising and exciting approach. It turns out that, remember, there are two parts to any test. The test inputs are really easy to generate. That's not a problem. Generating good test oracles remains an open challenge. People don't know how to do that. So our goal is create test oracles from something that programmers already write. Because remember, programmers are embedding all sorts of knowledge all throughout the program. So let's, let's talk about oracles for just a second. Um, automatic test generation, I said, is great. So here is some code from uh, an Apache library. It defines a class called filter iterator that has a constructor and it has a next method. And here's an automatically generated test. Um, it creates a new fil a filter iterator and then it calls i.next. If you run this test, it crashes. It throws a null pointer exception. So this is awesome because I found a bug in the software, right? OK, so what are the possibilities here? One possibility is I've actually discovered a bug in the software. What are other possibilities for what we might have discovered? OK, so another possibility is I misused the API. I should never have made this call, because the specification says, don't make this particular call. This is a problem that automatic test generators fall into all the time. OK, those are two possibilities. What's another possibility? So that was that the, uh, we discovered a bug, or that this was an invalid test. It could be expected behavior. Maybe the specification says, don't pass null. Maybe the specification says, uh, you're allowed to pass null. And if you do, here's exactly what's going to happen, a null pointer exception. So we have these three different possibilities. And the only way to know the, which one is correct is to look at the specification. So it turns out there is a specification here. And it says, throws a null pointer exception if either of these fields is null. So in fact, this is a correct test. And a test generation tool should reflect that. And, uh, and now, you can read this uh, Javadoc specification and know that this test is a correct test. Well, if you can do it, why can't a machine do it? Let's make a machine do that. So uh, the, just to recap, a test generation tool outputs failing tests and passing tests. The most important thing that a test generation tool outputs is, is failing tests, because uh, they reveal a bug. Uh, they also re uh, reveal regression tests that may be useful in the future. And without a specification, a tool has to guess for every test, is this a passing test or a failing test? Um, and this leads to false positives and false negatives. It leads to false positives where the tool says, hey, programmer, this test is reporting a bug, when in fact, the test is fine. And it, and it results in false negatives, where there's uh, some behavior, maybe it's an exception, maybe it's just a normal output, and the tool says, uh, does not report that to the programmer, because the tool isn't confident enough that that's really a problem and doesn't want to bug the program with a lot of irrelevant and unhelpful information. So how can we make these tools more precise? Well, and using information that programmers already write. Well, programmers already write code comments. In fact, I think it's awesome that Java programmers have been indoctrinated to write Javadoc. Uh, the IDE automatically inserts it, and people often write it, not all the time but often enough to be very useful. Here's an example of a Javadoc comment. It contains some free text and then a bunch of tags, like at throws. So this says that um, this throws an unsupported operation exception if the comparator is already locked. Here's another example of a Javadoc comment. Um, this is for a class called my class. It has a field all found so far and a, a Boolean routine uh, can convert. 
And then my method down here is a specification. It says it throws illegal argument exception if the element is not in the list and is not convertible. So can someone give me a Java expression that expresses exactly under what conditions that exception should be thrown? Just as Java code. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. That's exactly what I would have written too. Um, if not all found so far dot contains element and not can convert of element, then this exception should be thrown. Okay, so it's excellent you did that. Let's try to figure out how we could get a, a computer to do that. And the key intuition to get a computer to do that is to notice that nouns in your English documentation correspond to objects in the program. And that verbs in your English documentation correspond to operations in the program. So the first thing to do is to parse the sentence. Uh, this, uh, this is the sort of thing that you might have done in primary school. Uh, we, this sentence is made up of a noun phrase and a verb phrase. It has other phrases down below it. The nice thing about this is now it tells us which parts of the sentence are nouns and which parts of the sentence are verbs. So based on that, we can try to associate the nouns with some uh, object in the program and the verbs with some operation in the program. So for instance, the... Um, the element might correspond to a variable called elt, and is greater than might uh, correspond to compared to greater than or equal to zero. Now, we have the parse tree for the program. All we do is invert the parse tree, use the exact, uh, uh, and combine all of these back into a single operation. And now we've converted an English sentence into something that can be executed in a programming language. So we have a tool called Toradoku that does this. It parses param and return and throws tags from Javadoc. Javadoc also has this big paragraph at the beginning above those. That's super scary. I don't know how to deal with that yet, but we're going to try to do that in the future. Parsing gives you a parse tree and grammatical relations and cross-references. It turns out to be pretty hard to parse these because programmers don't write good English. Um, it's not, it may not be a full sentence. They use code snippets as nouns and verbs. They use jargon. Uh, references are implicit. Uh, so we have to do a little bit of pre-processing to clean that up. Um, then match each subject to a Java element, essentially to some expression in the program. Some of that is done by pattern matching. Other it is done by lexical similarity in the identifiers and the type in the documentation. You can think of it as Levenstein distance, but with a, a slightly more sophisticated e edit metric. Then match each predicate to an operation in the program in exactly the same way. And finally, create an assert statement from the expressions and the methods by just reversing the parse tree. So we've built this system. Uh, we ran it on almost 900 Javadoc tags. Uh, the system got 97% uh, precision and about 72% recall. Uh, this, is for, this is only for the tags that actually could be converted. So when we looked at code, a lot of tags were things like, throws IO exception if there's a problem uh, while reading the file. And there's no expression that you could use. So those aren't part of this, uh, of this measurement. We, um, I meant you can tune the parameters to, to, uh, to optimize either precision or recall. And the pre-processing and post-processing that I mentioned and the pattern matching all turn out to be really important. If you just try to feed this straight into the parser, it's not going to work. Um, we discovered a bunch of specification errors, places where people had written specifications that were internally inconsistent. And that wasn't obvious to the authors uh, clearly, but once we had formalized them, then uh, that popped right out. Um, we also found that this improved test generation tools. It, improved the, uh, it reduced the number of false positive failures that EvoSuite produced by more than a third. It improved Randoop a little bit too, not as much. Maybe Randoop was doing a little bit, uh, maybe its heuristics were a little bit better to start with. 
So there's a bunch of related work here. Some of it is about heuristics. So uh, early tools used a lot of heuristics like this, and even later ones too. If you have specifications, you can do a lot of fantastic stuff with test generation. Um, and people have thought about getting properties in other forms than formal specifications as well. There's also been a bunch of work in uh, trying to parse natural language documentation, but that's all really been uh, very pattern matching based, rather than thinking about the research that's been done in the natural language processing community. For instance, all three of these papers work only for a null and only do pattern matching. So let me tell you one last uh, direction, and that's thinking about how to implement functionality that doesn't exist yet. So I think one of the most exciting results out of natural language processing is machine translation. We have systems that can automatically take an English sentence, like my hovercraft is full of eels, and turn it into a Spanish sentence, like mi air deslizador está lleno de anguilas. Uh, now, here, it's actually kind of easy because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the words. But in certain parts of the Spanish-speaking world, the right way to say, uh, don't worry, is no te preocupes, don't let yourself uh, get preoccupied. And there isn't a one-to-one -one correspondence there, and there are many more examples of this. Yet, there are systems, uh, freely available even, that do a fantastic job of this. How do they work? Well, the currently most popular approach is something called recurrent neural networks. So a recurrent neural network is a sequence of cells uh, on this slide, I have about a dozen cells. Each cell has three layers. It has an input layer. The inputs are always drawn on the bottom. A hidden layer and an output layer. Now remember, uh, not machine learning can deal with any data you want as long as it's a sequence of, of reals. So we have to turn sentences into vectors of reals somehow. That's what the input layer does. Uh, now, Every other layer is essentially just a function over a vector of reals. So for instance, the hidden layer takes a vector of reals as input and produces two vectors of reals as output. And then the next hidden layer over takes two sequences, uh, two vectors of reals as an input and produces two more vectors of reals as an output. So for example, this vector of reals, oh, so uh, I'll show you an example in just a second. So for example, you, um, you might input, my hovercraft is full of eels, uh, and then the system will, uh, so if I look at this, um, this, it's a vector of reels that somehow captures the notion of ownership, first person ownership. And, thi and then the next line here, it's a, a vector of reels that somehow captures the notion of my hovercraft. And then this final output is a vector of reels that somehow captures the notion of my hovercraft being full of eels. So that's how you encode the meaning of a sentence. The, the way you uh, decode is first you give a start symbol and then out pops a vector of reels that corresponds to the word me. We feed that back in at the bottom and out uh, and together with this hidden information, out pops Erodus Lithador, and so forth. And remember, each of these boxes is a complex function from a vector of real to, reals to a vector of reals. And uh, that's all there is to it. There's this other, there's, these red dots are something called an attention mechanism that's been, uh, that turns out to be important to, uh, to help you figure out which part of my hovercraft being full of eels is actually the relevant one. Um, so everyone understands that? Everyone could code that up? The, the big challenge here is figuring out uh, what are those, uh, what are the three dozen functions here? And the way that that's done is by using a lot of training data. You take lots of pairs, say of English and Spanish, and uh, then you use uh, probability maximization and find the set of, uh, of formulas over vectors of reals that does this task best for all your input data. And then amazingly, it also works for output data as well. So 
If this process of converting things into vectors of reals, doing training, and, uh, and then getting a translator out works for natural language, if it works for translating English to Spanish, why doesn't it work for English to code? Why don't we try that? So we built a system called Tolina. Um, it takes as input uh, a, uh, an English sentence, such as find text files on the current folder, and then it produces output, a bash command, such as find dot minus name star dot txt. So you need some training data. We collected about 5,000 pairs of an English description and a bash command from the web, places like Stack Overflow and uh, tutorials and, uh, and other websites. We collected all those manually and then did a little bit of uh, cleaning. The, this data set handles 17 different file system utilities, about more than 200 flags, nine different types of comments. It handles a compound commands. It handles nesting, uh, process substitution. But all strings are opaque, so it doesn't handle command interpreters like, um, like said and awk. Uh, it also doesn't handle compound commands, bash commands like for. So uh, when you look at the accuracy of this system, the, uh, if you look at just the structure of the command without the constants like star.txt that I showed you, it's about 70% accurate. If you look at the exact results, whether it got all the constants right as well, the accuracy is about 30% for the first output. If you're willing to look at the first five outputs or so, then the accuracy goes up. OK, so this is interesting. What we have is a system that tells you a good answer a third of the time, tells you a somewhat useful answer a third of the time, and lies to you a third of the time. Is this useful? Well, this is what every machine learning technique is going to be. Right? So some of them are more accurate, some of them are less accurate, but all of them are sometimes going to give wrong answers or partially correct answers. And right now, no one knows whether we should spend more of our time trying to improve the uh, machine learning techniques to make them more accurate or improve user interfaces or whether they're actually good enough. So we decided to do a user experiment to figure that out. Um, we took uh, several dozen users, about 40. We gave them file system tasks. Uh, some of them got to use uh, Google and, and Stack Overflow and Man Pages, and some of them also got to use Tolina. The ones that got to use Tolina um, were 22% more efficient in performing these tasks. And, and that's true even though it's wrong some of the time. Um, we got a bunch of feedback from them. Uh, they, most of them wanted to continue using it. They found that these partially correct answers were actually helpful. For instance, it, it told them about new command line arguments they didn't know about that would be useful. Um, the, they found that sometimes the bash commands were, were in, invalid syntax or were subtly wrong, and it could be difficult to recover from that. So what they really wanted was a way of, of understanding the semantics of the bash. What we really need to do is uh, train a bash to English translator, and then for each of our outputs, also say this is what it means in English. Of course, that's going to have errors, too. So there's a bunch of work here. It's, this is um, built on very recent work in neural machine translation. Um, there's also been a bunch of work in semantic parsing to try to understand the meanings of, of, uh, of sentences. And there's also been work in translating natural language into DSLs. And that's probably the most closely related. There's been stuff done on uh, ift recipes, on regular expressions, on flight queries, like you would give when you're trying to book a flight. Um, all those domains are much simpler than ours. We have a much richer domain. So I'm doing a bunch of, I've, I've told you just this one thing. I'm doing a bunch of other stuff, like trying to figure out how do we analyze programs before programmers write them? And how do we enable people waiting at a bus stop to prove my program's correct, uh, just because it's more fun than waiting for the bus? And how do we evaluate fault localization, uh, doing a lot of work on lightweight type checking and others? So what I've told you here is the idea of trying to apply natural language processing to, to uh, program development tasks. And I showed you four different problems 
four different sources of natural language that programmers are already putting into their programs. We're not asking them to do anything new. And four different techniques. You could imagine using different techniques. There are more modern techniques that might work even better than these. And another way to view what I've told you is to think about the broad problem of programming. Right? Uh, there are all these tasks. And so far, we've been really thinking about just one little bit of it in terms of formalizations. But there are lots of other things you could do. Um, I showed how to use machine learning to expand that a little bit. Uh, but there are lots of other artifacts out here that could be, uh, that could be analyzed. And so what I want to, you to take away from this is that software is a lot more than just source code. And form, formal program analysis is exciting, and I love to do it. But it's not enough. It's not solving all the problems that programmers have today. What we should be doing is not just writing uh, systems that analyze ASTs or generate ASTs. We should be writing systems that analyze programs or generate programs. And that means the whole program, everything about it. So this is, uh, I've just scratched the surface in terms of the promise of, uh, of broadening our scope and looking at all parts of the program. So I hope that other people who are smarter than me will pick this up and do other exciting work as well. So I'd like to thank you very much for listening. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much for the great talk. And we have time for questions. Yes, please. Oh. Oh, the mic is coming. <laughs> it's also being recorded. That's the real reason they want the mic. So I'm, I'm very intrigued by, by your um, third uh, approach of, of understanding comments. And then um, I'm thinking of digging deeper into the program. And if you go beyond this specification header, you start seeing comments like, um, something's missing, to do. And I wonder if you can uh, do something with it and maybe focus the uh, you know, test generators to give more attention to that part of code, or you know, s utilize that in some other way. Uh, I think that's a great idea. So uh, what you're pointing at is that I've, uh, I've analyzed a little bit of the natural language in the program, and I'm missing a lot of other natural language in the program. I mean, even in terms of comments, I'm looking at just part of the method comment, but there are comments within the text as well. I think that makes a lot of sense. Probably just a pattern matching approach would find things like to do. But maybe you could um, look at the English text and see whether it's consistent with the code that's immediately above or below it. Or you could look at different uh, inline comments in different parts of the program and see if they're consistent with one another. I think those would be really interesting uh, areas for future exploration. Great idea. Over there. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So um, I was curious about uh, uh, the part where you were mentioning um, trying to analyze the semantic types of variables, saying that it doesn't make sense to uh, add a, a price with distance. But uh, it's actually highly dependent on the uh, operation you're using, because uh, uh, it could make perfect sense to divide, for instance, a price by distance. So uh, how, do you, how do you deal with that? OK, so that's a great question. Um, the Abstract type inference that we do actually has four different modes. For instance, it has a mode where addition is considered to merge two types, but division is not, and multiplication. And then another mode where all arithmetic uh, operations are considered to merge two types. So depending on which mode you ran it in, uh, it would either be inferring abstract types like physical constant, or it could be inferring abstract types like um, distance versus acceleration versus velocity. So uh, we ran it on the mode where, uh, where division did merge things. Uh, you could imagine running it on the other modes, and that would make sense. A very exciting talk. Um, 
Uh, I have one question, namely um, the examples you gave are, uh, you showed how uh, we can generate code or tests from scratch, but how about if you want to change existing um, an existing program, because I think that's where the real problems occur. So I think that's a fantastic point. So um, a lot of people spend their time thinking about writing programs from scratch. Uh, for any successful program, you're going to spend 90% or more of your effort ma doing maintenance. Because if your program is successful, people are going to use it in ways you didn't anticipate. You're going to have to extend it. You're going to have to fix bugs. If your program is unsuccessful, then once you've written it, you'll never have to change it. Um, so I think uh, there you would want to somehow uh, incorporate both the semantics of the old program and the semantics of the new program. And, uh, you know, just off the top of my head on this stage, I don't have good ideas for that. But I think that's a fantastic problem. I mean, I, I put this space up there of, of things that programmers do and artifacts they use, and that's extremely incomplete. It would have been completely black with text if I tried to put everything. I think this is a fantastic point. And we're still trying to figure out how to do all this work. Okay, I have a slightly philosophic question. There is a school of people that fight for sound and complete, or at least sound, and I'm pretty sure there is a lot of people in the audience that strive to produce sound techniques, and there is a school, another school that strive for practical and useful. Mm -hmm. What is your view on that? So I think we have to have both. So uh, one of the projects I'm working on now that uh, I didn't talk about is on type systems. Uh, so we have, we're building lightweight, practical lightweight verification tools. I think every type system has to have two properties. It needs to be sound and it needs to be useful. If it's not sound, then it's just a hack. Even if it happens to help people, you don't have a guarantee. But if it's not comprehensible to people and scalable to real problems, then you're really just doing theory. You're, you're not uh, helping people in their real tasks. So when I build a type system, I like to prove that it's correct, and then I like to run it on a few million lines of code. So uh, there are different tasks you can perform. If we're thinking about verification, then obviously soundness is paramount. Uh, if you're thinking about bug finding or helping people to perform tasks, then soundness is not all that important. It turns out that uh, research shows that when people are provided with information that's mostly correct, but has some omissions or has some flaws, they're able to pretty quickly identify that and move on. So I think we should remember that there's, uh, you know, if you think about software development, it's a little frustrating when I have my formalist hat on because there's this non-ideal component in the loop. There's this uh, non-perfect component. It's called the human being. Uh, but it's also an incredibly powerful component, and it's a component that we should be using effectively. We should be trying to make the machine do absolutely everything it can to, uh, to reduce effort and to get things right. And we should uh, let the human do the rest. So that's kind of a non-answer to your question. I think it, uh, it depends largely on um, what is your task and what's your domain. There are domains where uh, we absolutely need formal verification. They're, they're critical. And other domains where uh, helping people to, uh, to do some of their tasks more effectively uh, is enough, especially because even in formal verification, there's always some trusted computing base. There's always something that you can't handle. OK, one last question before we go to the break. Are there any pressing there's questions there? there? So, thank you for the nice talk and uh, a bit out of our space. Um, I'm wondering, uh, because you, your mainstream uh, technique is machine learning, I'm wondering if you are considering uh, making some connections with cognitive theories or linguistics, and I'm giving you some reasons, I mean two reasons for which I'm asking this question. Uh, for example, uh, Dino Di Stefano just explained to us, like yesterday, I think, um, that uh, he's using abduction, which is a uh, well, cognitive concept, and then this abduction 
practically, I mean, the concept explained practically the, the kernel of his uh, uh, technique. While um, for linguistics, I can tell you that uh, Chomsky has an interesting theory that says that basically all the languages have uh, the same structure, follow the same, same structure, and then there are also theories saying that, uh, for example, <clears throat> The modern languages, especially Romance languages, um, are following a context-free uh, language structure which was basically invented by the Romans. So my question is if you think that it would help in your uh, technique, uh, mechanism of machine learning to introduce or to uh, correlate your technique with some of these uh, concepts that are available but not outside our uh, computer science space? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. So uh, I think there are two ways you could... So the question is, how can we take um, other concepts from linguistics? So right now, I'm really focused completely on computational linguistics. I'm not looking at other aspects of linguistics, and it's a very rich field, um, largely because I want to try to extract semantics and tie things back into formal analysis. But in terms of uh, how we could use this, you can imagine using the, this other linguistic uh, research in a couple of ways. One would be, how can we actually mechanize it? How can we actually put it into practice to extract more semantics? And the other could be, um, how should we uh, design programming languages, or how should we design tools to communicate their results in effective ways? So uh, it's certain that uh, artificially created languages are very different than natural languages in structure. And Chomsky was wildly influential, but uh, that's not the dominant uh, school of thought in linguistics today. I mean, his, his influence is clearly on the, on the, um, on the Wayne, the Warfian, a school, for instance, is much more popular, much, and there's a lot of good evidence for it. I'd be happy to talk to you about that offline. But uh, so I think the main point you're, you're saying is, look, you're looking at this really little, little tiny part of linguistics. Uh, programs are about communication. Programs are for communication between people, and they, incidentally, they're also for communication between you and the machine. And so we should, treat, we should think of them as communication and figure out how can we, can, can we make that communication precise and clear, which are not uh, facts that are generally true about natural languages, but also take advantage. I mean, what we should be doing is taking advantage of the incredible cognitive uh, processing that's available in the human, right? Humans should not be thinking like computers. Computers should be uh, using and presenting information in ways that people can use most effectively. Okay, thank you so much again for your talk. This is a small but rather heavy <laughs> present for ETOPS organizers. Thank you very much. And thank thanks you. for all the questions and for your attention. I really enjoyed it. So we now have a break until 10.30, a small uh, 